There's no introduction, so we're not going to do a while. So I am. Yes, sorry. Um, welcome to rather a lot of people online uh, who I hope you can hear us. I can hear my echo, um, and I'm sure we've got lots of people out there. We are in Port Palace House in uh, the Palace of Westminster. We've got a number of parliamentarians and some representatives from the first Palace of Mondays uh, movement. We just had uh, a gem, and the purpose of this morning is to have the formal launch of the first thousand one days uh, manifesto for babies, which is this very uh, shiny red um, document. We've got some experts here to talk through the various recommendations that are being made ahead of um, an election. And this, of course, is a key time for various organizations and interest groups to lobby and get the attention of political parties as we go into what is most likely to be an election at some stage later this uh, uh, this year, um, and a good time to get people's attention. Now, this is a, an issue where certainly Andrea and many others have been campaigning on for many, many years. And since this group was first set up by Andrea back in 2011 or 12, 2011, and the launch of the, uh, the manifesto all those 13, 12, 13 years um, ago, when this movement's become quite a, quite a tour de force, um, and this issue is no less important than it was uh, when our group was first set up all those, uh, all those years ago. So um, you're all very welcome. We are going to have a series of presentations about the major uh, proposals within the um, manifesto. Then we're going to hear from the um, minister, uh, and then um, we're also going to hear from Sally Ann Hart, the MP for Hastings, who has got a private member's bill, uh, which passed its first hurdles last Friday in the House of Commons, and which is about putting some flesh on the bones of some of the undertakings of the first thousand one um, days, which the government are supporting. So she's going to tell us about uh, what that involves, and where hopefully it's going to end up on the statute book and the implications of, uh, of that. Um, if we have... Um, if we have time for questions and discussion at the end, let alone the technological um, know-how, then we will do that in the areas to end at about 10 o'clock. Okay, so is everybody in the right room? Everybody in the right <laughs> virtual room? In that case, we have got five presentations for the manifesto. I'm going to start first with Keith uh, Reed, who's the CEO of the Parent Infant Foundation, who are the secretariat to the all-party group. Keith, over to you. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all the parliamentarians today, key proponents for babies, um, and so we're delighted you can join us. I'm going to give a little bit of context about the manifesto and then just highlight a couple of the urgent policy arts within it, and then I'm going to hand over to partners and colleagues who are going to explain a slightly higher level recommendations. So last year we surveyed the membership of the movement. There are now over 200 charities professional bodies and experts that are members. And we asked them, we asked them what, if you had a wish list of what would appear in the different political parts and manifestos, what would they be? And whenever you ask charities to give an opinion, they're very good at doing that. So over a hundred replied, and there are many, many hundreds of suggestions. The Movement Steering Group, which is listed, all of these logos up on this slide here, then went through those suggestions, also to expert advice from users and from experts working with services supporting babies and families to produce the manifesto that we're formally launching today. And just to highlight a couple of those high-level policies within, the, within that manifesto. So if we go to the next slide, if that's all. So as everyone knows in the room here, the first 1,001 days is a crucial period of brain development and sadly many babies are not getting the sensitive nurturing care it's the foundations for their healthy development and we're in the movement because we really want to speak up for those babies in particular who are living in fear and distress and as yet one of the policy proposals that we're suggesting there's no national target yet for supporting those particularly vulnerable babies and the manifesto calls for the NHS to introduce a target to support 60,000 vulnerable babies over the next five years. 
but we're also concerned that many more babies still aren't getting top appointments. Too many are missing their health visitor checks and specialist services that do wonderful work while carrying infant relationship teams are patchy at this point in time. So the next slide, please. Then. And as we can see from the OVID data, toddler development <coughs> hasn't really moved. In fact, it's gradually declined over the past year. So that's not something any of us in this room or outside this room would wish to see. Next slide. But things are changing for the better. And things are changing for the better, and there's real hope. And the things for the better, the government starts a life for them, which is hugely welcome. But the reality is it's just beginning its journey, a bit like this tiny baby. And we want to see it grow strong, grow up, and really mature to be the best it can possibly be. And our concern, and again, one of the clear asks of the manifest that is funding is due to run out in April 2025. So it's a crucial year. And we all want all parties to commit to supporting it going forward. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Vicky. Thank you, Keith. I'm Vicky Nevin, Policy Manager at the NSDCC, and I'm going to present the first recommendation in the manifest. So, so almost every government department, I would say, has a stake in policy for babies, and it's critical to make sure that that decision making is coordinated effectively. The Start for Life programme is currently addressing the fragmentation of local services for babies, and it's great to see my one-year-old boy pointing with excitement at um, the newly launched family hub in our local area. So. We need to see that level of excitement for the early years and that strategic join up for programmes at a national level as well. So how is policy for babies effectively coordinated at a national government level? The first 1001 Days movement is also a supporter of the Children's Charity Coalition and together with 200 other civil society organisations, we partnered with the Institute for Government to discuss the practicalities of coordinating across government with former senior civil servants, with academics and civil society leaders. And this helped inform our thinking around some joint recommendations, one of which you see reflected in the Manifesto for Babies. So that is that number one, we see an ambitious cross-government strategy for babies, children and young people. And that needs to be backed by a common outcomes framework. And number two, we want to see a cabinet committee reporting to the prime minister. And um, this is needed so that planning, budgeting and policy levers are all pulling in the same direction. To achieve transformational change for babies, we need to see senior political leadership. Ultimately, this must come from the Prime Minister, but the Chancellor is also, must also be a champion as the Treasury controls powerful levers uh, for determining children's living standards and the public services that they have access to. We also need to see the voices of babies and parents represented in policymaking. <clears throat> babies can tell us how they feel. They can express happiness, distress, frustration, Trust me, I speak from recent experience on that one. Um, so it's our responsibility to create an environment that supports them to make a meaningful contribution to policy making. And parents must also be engaged in the process as users of public services. They don't see organisational and bureaucratic um, barriers and boundaries in the same way that policymakers do. So they can help us view problems differently and prompt more collaboration. Um, on the next slide, I've just put a summary of what um, sorry, for that, the, the benefits are. So a cross-departmental strategy will prevent siloed policy development, implementation and evaluation. It will take better account of decisions made in one department, but felt in other departments. So the impact of health visiting on school readiness, the impact of perinatal mental health problems on capacity to work. Cross departmental working um, can reduce inefficiencies, it can, it can improve data and information sharing, which is vital for evaluation, and it can make best use of the full suite of public services and policy levers available. 
So we believe that the responsibility for first 1,001 days should not just sit solely with the Start for Life Minister or the Children's Minister, but it should be a shared priority that is championed across government. I'll hand over to my colleague. Hi, I'm Peter Grigg. I'm Chief Executive of Homestart UK. Homestart is a federation of 180 charities and communities supporting families. Um, now, I thought it was quite a bold move by the coalition to speak to a group of very supportive parliamentarians and start my slide with two fingers up at everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, right way yeah, yeah, at least <laughs> it's the right, the right way around. Um, I mean, I think we're in a, in a group of, in a, a room of people online too, of real support for children and families. And Andrea, your work, Tim, over many years, you've been making the case, and that's why one of the reasons we're here. And none of these recommendations on one level are anything you haven't heard before. You know, they're all very familiar. So the question is really, why now? You know, what are we trying to particularly get across now? And what's different? And I think what's different, certainly from a home start perspective, is when I speak with our, our home starts across the UK, um, our traditional work of volunteer-led activity with children and families is, is more difficult than ever. At one end, it's because of poverty alleviation and needing to actually make sure that families are okay before we can even start talking about parenting and family work. And at the other end, volunteer-led work increasingly doing more complexity of support, and that's, that's a challenge for a volunteer-led organisation. And so when we talk about investing more in prevention, if I can have the next slide, please, Ben. You, you know all of this, you know the efficiency, the Heckman curve of investing early. This is not an either or, it's not investing in babies and children as opposed to older people. It's saying that it's a foundational investment that will have benefit to everything else in school terms, in job terms, in employment terms, everything. I think we know that, we understand it's logical. Uh, we understand a stitch in nine and everything else, a uh, stitch in time saves nine. But the thing is, it doesn't happen. And over the last decade, there's been a dramatic cut in terms of public health funded services for North Fives, over 26% real terms cut uh, just in the last 10 years. That's compounded by other cuts. There's been an almost 50% decline in early intervention funding. And as charities, we certainly feel that we're propping up the gaps, we're propping up there's a, a report by NPC recently that suggested it was to the tune of 2.4 billion pounds each year that charities were picking up the pieces. And I can tell you firsthand, this is not, this is fragile. Charities are fragile right now, it's precarious. And we can't rely on this forever. So everything that we have here in terms of investing more in prevention and earlier on, it does rely on a lot of infrastructure, a lot of support. And we know the arguments about the cost of later invention. Uh, in, in, of the cost of later interventions. So what does this mean? It means more investment in preventative services, in health visiting, in the infrastructure of charities and all the uh, support in communities to provide that compassionate support to families. It means the Treasury recognising the full benefits of longer term investment. It means extending funding for Start for Life so that every community can have a family hub and a children's centre. I mean, it doesn't make sense not to do that. You know, I know that this room is supportive, but how can we make that happen right now? And it means looking at the wider impacts on things like the NHS long term plan and how can the NHS invest in the mental health and well-being of parents and of children. And getting all these things right together, I think, is where we're coming from with this recommendation. Moving on to our third recommendation. As we uh, work hard to support babies, children and families, the question we have to all ask ourselves is, are we doing this in the most equitable and fair way? Babies aren't born equal. They're born from the very beginning, even before they're born. They're, it's not an equal playing field. We need to tackle inequalities so that all babies can have a good start in life. And what does that mean in practice? We've talked about a national strategy to pull the pieces together so that all babies in the first 1,001 days get the support they need. We, can I have the next slide please, Ben? We know that poverty impacts child development. Um, Professor Marmot, uh, we, we quote in the, in the manifesto, poverty experienced during childhood harms health at the time and throughout the rest of life. So child poverty matters. And we have the situation with a two child limit uh, on, on uh, welfare, which is just really impacting the third child for no particular reason. 
I mean, it's a, it, it feels morally difficult to justify that the third child can't have the sort of support that the second child can. And, and this does matter for future child development. We can see integrated care systems developing, and that's great. But how can we make them accountable for their statutory duty to reduce health inequalities, support babies? And that's work we'd like to see. We want to target the gap in life expectancy where um, the, the difference between the most and least deprived uh, deciles is 10 years for men and 8.6 years for female. This is real life and death situations that we're talking about. We need to invest early to get this right. And we have the situation where we're learning more about the, uh, the inequalities in terms of different ethnicities and the experience of maternity care. We know that rates of pregnancy loss and baby deaths are higher among black and Asian babies compared with white babies. And if we know this, and we know the fear that black women will be having when they're pregnant, thinking about these stats that you see in the newspaper that you read about, the fear that that will create and the environment that that creates for the baby as they're born, we need to tackle this and get this written into the heart of our strategies for supporting babies. So thank you for, for your time. I know that you agree with all this, but I think our moment is now to get this in the next iteration in the next chapter of our story for the first thousand one days. Thank you. Eunice. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Eunice Lumsden. I'm Professor of Child Advocacy at the University of Northampton and I'm absolutely delighted um, as, as my role is in advocacy to be advocating for babies today who are very silent in the workforce agenda. Um, so I'm about recommendation four which is about developing a workforce plan for children's social care in early years and um, we're recommending, and I think that what is different now, and I think it's really important that people recognise around the room who have been invested in this area for decades now, is that we have a real crisis in the workforce, that we have a wonderful start on our strategy, um, we have um, funding opportunities for parents who are in work, but actually we have a crisis in the workforce which is unprecedented. So we are calling for advocates staffing levels with practitioners who are appropriately qualified. Um, um, to support babies and in all social care and early years settings. Um, I think all the research stresses that we should have a graduate-led workforce in the early years. We do not have it now. In fact, many settings are losing hemorrhaging staff um, at, at a very, very um, high rate. Um, and we've now, luckily, the government are doing a consultation on child minders, which was launched last week, which is absolutely vital in order to um, get appropriate people in the right places to care for our youngest citizens. Um, at the moment, we know that many settings, nursery settings, are relying on unqualified staff and that they put the lowest qualified staff in baby rooms where we have our youngest children, some from nine weeks old, with staff who are not supported, with three, three staff maybe caring for nine babies in, in that room. And if one of them is ill, one of them needs their nappy changing or needs some other attention, there are not the hands on deck to be actually meet, meeting the attachment and belonging needs and developmental needs of our youngest citizens. We need to be collaborating across all the professional bodies to address this issue now, or we are creating unprecedented issues for the future that the work against what the Start of Life offer is offering in our family hubs. And I think we need to recognise that now and take action. We need a workforce plan that brings the social care and early years workforce and complements the NHS workforce plan. We have to stop working in silos. We have to come together and we have to have to end up working. We need to make the start for life offer and the workforce elements of that offer reality rather than what is actually happening in practice where we have that offer and the early years sector, the early childhood education and care sector working differently. We need to review training recruitment urgently because we are not recruiting people into the sector. We are not getting the apprentices through and reports that were out today from the um, Family and Child Care from Thomas Corum have shown that there has been a 42% drop since last year in provision in the sector. People are earning more working in Aldi and Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer's than they earn 
doing one of the hardest and most important jobs in our society, which is giving our children the best start for life. Next slide, please, thank you. And you can see from here that we have a shortfall in our health visitors, massive shortfall, where parents are not getting the support and the visits they need. We have a shortfall in midwives, and we have end eight in 10 early year settings, and probably more now, actually struggling to recruit staff. We do not, we have a range of level three staff who have the skills, but we have, do not have the graduates in the workforce that are needed to meet the needs of our youngest children. So we are strongly recommending, which I'll reinforce again, that we need this social care and early years workforce plan to complement the NHS workforce plan and help um, the workforce and improve staff retention. We need to value those that work in the sector because if we have babies away from their primary caretakers, they need plus, plus, plus. And at the moment, we are not offering plus, plus, plus as a nation. Thank you. I'm Cassie Jones. I'm Chief Executive Fatherhood Institute. And I'm really delighted to be here to advocate for babies and for fathers. Fathers are away at the kind of missing link and the sort of un and a whole untapped social capital. Um, so we're advocating for government to recognise that supporting babies' healthy development is equally important a policy objective as getting new parents back to work. We want to see parental choice to return to work to be really well supported, so mothers in particular. And we want government to provide six weeks well-paid paternity and parental leave to help dads play a more active role. And then finally, we want to see training and infant mental health for nursery staff and all of those working in paid settings, caring for under twos. And that really is what Eunice has been saying about the, the sort of quality and the support the workforce received. Um, next slide, please. So my youngest grandson, Teddy, is two. When Teddy is hurt, afraid, hungry, he calls out, Papa, Mama, or Mama, Papa. He knows that either of his parents will meet his needs for comfort, for security, and capable care. And his father's embodiment of early, competent, solo care, as well as having positive impacts on Teddy's um, language development, engagement with the social world, and future success in education, normalizes the expectation that both men and women can care and work. His parents have consciously created an environment in which it's possible for both to care, but this is in spite of the paternity and the parental leave offer available from the state, which doesn't support that. So their experience of struggling to work out a way to share caring and earning is reflected in the lives of many of the families that we encounter in our work. And it's particularly the case for couples with insecure work, unpredictable income, and little control of decisions made by employers. So in the world of employment, very often we do not see men's fatherhood. We see, their, we see them as employees breadwinning. A dad who works nights in a factory, who's just been told by his employer that they will extend the end of his working day from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. So he can't get home in time to take over care of his baby from his wife, who works days. A Polish dad who works long hours in the building trade, who can't promise to be there for bedtime because his working week is totally unpredictable. The 80% of families who contain a father who's eligible for statutory paternity leave face a drop in earnings of more than a thousand pounds if he works full time for average earnings and takes two weeks at the statutory rate. So more than half of families say that they experienced the financial struggle when a father took leave. And in a third of families with an income of less than 25 grand, a household income, the father didn't take any leave at all. So our current leave design deprives, deprives fathers opportunities to build really close early attachments. And these are critical. So again, fathers are kind of the missing link or the hidden link unseen part of the puzzle. Um, and it, but it deprives them of opportunities to build close early attachments, and deprives mothers of opportunities to work or study as well as care. 
And until fathers have their, their own rights, well paid leave to care for their young children solo, and the solo bit is really important, it's how we build competence. Ideally, when their father is at work, in education or in training, father's uptake in parenting leave will remain limited, disadvantaging his babies, their mother, the family, the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. So five um, very clear presentations, five different um, aspects of the starting life uh, manifesto. So very clearly put. Thank you very much, everybody. We almost kept to time. I'm going to go straight to the minister now to Andrew Levson for her response to that in the border manifesto as well. Thank you. Um, it's fantastic as ever to be here, and uh, it's been a long time that this APPG has kept going, and well done, Tim. Yeah. He's yeah. just yeah. done a brilliant job over so long. Yeah. And um, I've been passionate about early years for about 27 years now, and um, and have worked with a number of people across the sector who have joined the first 1001 Days movement, which I set up as a new MP. And um, and so this is absolutely my passion. So a lot of the things that you talked about here, I completely recognise and can assure you, um, like a swan, I'm gliding on the surface and kicking people in the teeth under, under the water. Does the swans do that? But um, really, really passionate about giving every baby the best start for life. So um, having through through this government, I I, I totally understand. Um, the frustration of people on individual bits of policy and lack of join up. And I completely agree it would be fantastic to have one day a cabinet minister with responsibility for the best start for life. But we're not there yet, but we will get there. I think we will get there. I think there's emerging recognition of the crucial importance of this. But just to take one minute to tell you the background to the Family Hub and Start for Life programme, because it does actually answer a lot of the issues raised today. So that um, research took place during 2020 and 2021, during lockdowns. And essentially, there were the thing that was, it was talking to parents and carers. And number one thing that every parent and carer said is, I found I was pregnant and I was like, oh, what next? You know, where do I go? What should I do? What, what help can I get? So the absolute requirement of every parent and carer was for a start for life offer, something that tells you what services are available to you, however good or bad they are, and where you could find them. So information, absolutely critical. And the second thing that parents and carers, all of them said, is wherever you want me to go, don't let it be stigmatizing. So I'm a big fan of short starts. I was involved in a big short start in Rose Hill 27 years ago. And, and talked with Tessa Jow and Frank Field and David Blungett. So I do not see any politics in this. However, sure starts did end up stigmatizing people. And a lot of people now, as I visit family hubs, many of which were phase one sure starts because they're big buildings, they've tended to remain as children's centers. So now they're being converted to family hubs. And, and, and a number of the challenges they've had revolve around the fact that there is stigma associated with that place, oh no, you don't, you don't, because if your you children will get taken away if you go there. Now that is, I'm slightly exaggerating to prove the point, but essentially what families wanted was a universal place where they could go and just hang out, just get a cup of tea, just talk to someone, just say, can you just hold the baby for a minute while I go to the loo? You know, just a bit of me time. So a lot of family hubs, and there are now well over 400 around the country, so they're spreading like wildfire. My condition is we will see thousands of them. And yes, they will be in old phase one short start buildings, which is fantastic. There's that continuity. And lots of them are doing fantastic relaunches where they make it their business to get as many parents with babies in as they possibly can. And so the idea of the Family Hub and Start for Life programme, backed by 300 million quid, is that 75, I wanted it to be 100% of local authorities, but it's actually one in two. That was the Treasury rule. So I insisted it wasn't a pilot. They insisted it wasn't universal, so compromise. One in two local authority areas get funding. And all of them have opened family hubs. So half of all upper tier local authority areas now have family hubs. That's where we're up to. And to be a family hub, you have to have the Start for Life offer within that family hub. So you have to have midwifery, health visiting, mental health support and parent-infant relationship support, 
breastfeeding and infant feeding support. You have to have antenatal classes. You have to have a universal plus offer, which could include smoking cessation, um, uh, support for dads to become new dads. Um, it could be uh, support for reduction of domestic violence. It could be debt and, debt and housing advice and so on and so on. So family hubs, they are a one-stop shop. The way I see it is, if you want a pint of milk, go to Tesco, Aldi, wherever you want. If you've got a baby, go to the family hub, and that's where you will find everything you need, friendship, support, services, advice, and that is what's happening. So every single Thursday, I visit family hubs, okay? You can track me on <laughs> social media if you want to see where I've been. And actually, what I'm finding now into year two of this rollout is things are really, really changing. And, and and families are loving the family hubs. I'm so glad to hear you saying that your baby is like, yes, I like it there. Everywhere I go and see family hubs and the parents are like, this is exactly what we need. And actually, just to give you one story, I won't say where, but I, I was in a place where there were two yummy mummies, okay? And there was a young a younger woman who was not of the same ethnic background and they were all there with their babies and they were saying to me, They'd love the fact that they've met each other, that they wouldn't have met each other any other way. But in the family hub, their, their tiny, you know, one-year-olds were playing together and it was the most fantastic community building thing. That really warms my heart. I know it will warm all your hearts. But obviously, we can't just have a fine spray of goodwill. This has to be absolutely focused. So the idea of the family hubs and Start for Life is they will, the Start for Life programme is totally outcomes focused. So some of the things we're doing this week, we're starting a, 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 a social media and public health program called If They Could Tell You. And it's all about um, babies. And exactly as, as has been said, they can communicate. They do communicate. But very often parents don't really see their cues, know their cues, mm -hmm. understand their cues. So this is about if they could tell you I'd like a cuddle, if they could tell you I really love it when you do X, when you read to me, when you gaze into my eyes. All of these things, absolutely fantastic. We are also, you'll be pleased to know, in the middle of creating an outcomes framework, many of you have been consulted on this, which is outcomes for babies. And it will be, it will reflect some of the work that the Children's Commissioner has done on outcomes for children, but it will be unique to babies. I do still worry that government doesn't realise that children aren't actually born age four and not school ready. They're born before that. And what happens to them before that really matters. So an outcomes framework. Um, in terms of dads, you're absolutely right to raise the issue of dads. I mean, if if I could have my time again, I think we we have a fully funded 100 million for parent infant relationships, 50 million for breastfeeding, 50 million for parental education. I would have had something for dads because dads are so critical. So everywhere I go, I ask, what are you doing for dads? One thing I absolutely love is um, is baby first aid for dads because it gets dads to handle their babies where they might be not that confident that's a baby I don't will I drop it you know and that that is a thing and actually dads have really engaged with that there are lots of ways to engage with dads and also just you know baby steps for dads ways for a new dad to think okay life's going to change because actually it's as it is a huge huge life change so a lot lot more for dads and more recently in my visits to family hubs i'm finding men being employed there and loads of dads coming along for different services and support so it is changing it really is changing now i see plenty of men in the family hubs whereas when we first started this rollout it was only women so that is a really good sign in terms of the workforce um in the start for life unit we have a 10 million pilot scheme to um, create multidisciplinary workforces. And actually, I completely take the point Eunice makes about the qualifications and the standing of people who are working with babies in an exclusive care relationship. But actually, in a family hub, what we do want to see is people who are just going to make you a cup of tea, sit and chat to you, you know, signpost you to different services. And actually, that multidisciplinary workforce can then provide more capacity to the health visitors so they can do what they need to do. Whereas actually then somebody else can weigh the baby, can can help you with, with figuring out where you need to go for X, Y, and Z. So there's a lot of really good work going on at the center. There's also a lot of training. Um, so in terms of developing parent-infant relationship teams in the family hubs, as we know, it's always been the Cinderella service, perhaps 
the most critical thing. It's certainly the thing that brought me into this space through uh, my work with OxPip and then setting up PIPs around the country and indeed PIP UK some years ago. So it was always about the parent-infant relationship. And as we know, those um, specialists don't grow on trees. So there's training being provided by the centre in you know, e-learning and things like trauma-informed care, but also in video interaction guidance and in, in providing um, advice, information and evaluation on things like infant massage, which is incredibly valuable in getting people into a sort of therapeutic relationship if they're a bit nervous about that. So there's a lot going on. And I do encourage everyone to, to really go and visit a family hub in your area, go and kick the tyres, because I think uh, people are sort of saying, well, you know, it's only a three year programme, it's going to run out next year, it's been said here. That isn't the case in my world. That is not happening, OK? I'm doing my work with members of the opposition, if anyone's on there. Um, they know who they are. And we're all agreed cross party. You know, if you if you want to hear Sally Ann's um, Westminster Hall debate on her private members bill just last week, you had me replying and uh, and Andrew Gwynn replying for Labour. And it was the biggest love in you've ever seen. We were all, you know, Tim spoke and gave set out the importance of the early years and we were all violently agreeing this isn't going anywhere so let's make sure that it's in a really good place to go forward rather than introducing any politics you know this is not political in my view what this should be is like when your child turns four and they get a place in reception don't they but when they're born they don't get anything do they so in my view, this needs to be like reception. No one's sort of politically arguing about whether we're going to bother with reception for your child or not. This should be, congratulations, you're pregnant, and assuming that you do want to go ahead with it, how can we support your family to get through what is absolutely life-changing and get you into a good path? And that is about, it's supporting the primary carers. It's not let the state raise your babies. It's let's help the families to be able to give their own babies the best start for life and that's families of every sort and shape and and color and background and single parents and same-sex parents and older parents and younger parents and parents who don't speak english put them all in this one-stop shop so that everybody knows where to go and everybody can get that help to support their babies to give them the best start for life thank you and um, breathe right <laughs> <laughs> well you always say be quick so I'm <laughs> Um, we are running out of time. Are we, are we hard to stop at 10 in this room? I don't know. I can check if someone's in after it. In theory, we are. OK, so that was very quickly. let's go straight on to Sally Ann now to update. So, so, yeah, so right. very quickly. So um, I was a lawyer, magistrate in Hastings, 14 years working in the family proceedings courts. That's why I'm doing this job. Early intervention and prevention, getting children and families right and education is so important because uh, this is... You know, we've got issues in Hastings, as you can see, in recent press. And if we actually get children and families right from the very start, it can prevent all the other things happening down the line. So I'm massively in favour of investment in early years. So the support for infants and parents, etc. So that's um, prospective parents and carers um, is intended to support, as um, Andrea said, about information given to parents about the support available. And that's what this bill does. So it sort of comes in three sections. It's about having a duty on local authorities to um, uh, publish the support available. And then it has the services. And there are um, about six services. And then it has alter you know, other services that the local authority considers important. So those are maternity services, health visiting, services for promoting infant parent relationship support services, mental health services, breastfeeding and infant feeding. So it does, it's a whole um, um, support services. It has um, a regulation um, for the Secretary of State to, to um, provide guidance to local authorities and it will consult with local, uh, local authorities on that guidance. So that's really important. And then finally, which is really important because it has to be evidence based as well, is that the Secretary of State has to um, uh, produce a report on outcomes. So you're looking at um, what works and how it benefits and then prove that this is actually working and it benefits um, children and families. And so I think it's brilliant. And thank you, Andrea, for all your advice on this. <laughs> Can I do that? 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the government is supporting it. Yes. So, yes. yes. Thank you. So in terms of the timetable for that, it now goes into committee. And committee the stage, top. yes. And then we're trying to ensure that it gets through before the election. So it has to uh, come back to the Chamber of the House of Commons, then it goes to the House of Lords. Yeah. Hopefully they'll say, well, wonderful. Yes. Bit, I'm sure Lord will agree. be a major support for this. And yeah. actually, uh, and it seems like um, no one's got a quibble about this yeah. at all. And yeah. so it should sail through very easily. Uh, well, says, the minister said, I have full confidence. confidence. Aggressive. Make it happen. <laughs> make it happen. Make yes. it happen. Yes. Aggressive agreement going on in the debate last week. So that made very yes. well. So look, we're going to have to. Um, bring it to a, an, an end now. But I think, thank you for those five really punchy presentations. Yeah, really and thank you to all the, the First Mondays movement who produced, I think, what's a really good and clear um, document. Um, and for all of those listening online, this is your ammunition to go and lobby your MP uh, and any MPs you come across, and particularly front benchers, representatives, more than uh, all the parties, as we approached the election last year. This is the best time to try and get parliamentarians to commit to many of the things within this manifesto. You're about to... I just wanted to say one thing. That is model modelled on the Red Book. And anybody who wants to lobby their MP for a digital version of the Red Book, it would be incredibly helpful for me. There's, a, there's an additional <laughs> request. Because yeah. the, the Red Book is such an important joining up process yeah. and part of the whole Best After um, uh, project. Um, so please do, do use that. Um, this will be available online on the Franklin Foundation website. Live now. It's now. already there. So you can download a full copy and circulate to all your family, friends, and other people you might come into contact with, um, uh, with, with parliamentarians. Um, but there is an awful lot going on. I mean, if, if, we, if we went back 12, 15 years ago, um, there was a lot of talk about how important this was, but there's a lot of meat now on the, uh, on the bones of what is already happening and a huge amount of ambition for where that needs to continue um, going and absolutely whatever happens in the election. And I think those of us who were responsible for putting together the whole this stuff in, in life, led by Andrea, were very adamant that it should be a cross-party um, yeah. exercise so that it, it survives the government's election um, cycle, which can be so damaging to really good ideas. Um, and so I hope we've got the buy-in of, uh, of everybody and the, and the room's a good forum uh, for that. So thank you to everybody for uh, listening to us uh, today. Thank you very much for our five um, speakers. Thank you very much to the uh, Minister for championing um, all this and continuing yeah. to champion yeah. uh, all this. Thank you to Sally on uh, for putting uh, some meat on the bones with her bill going through, which we hope then will become law in the uh, in the summer, ahead of a, an election, it needs to get in before the election uh, mm -hmm. to succeed. Uh, and thank you for being here today. And I think we close the meeting at one minute to ten, unless anybody else has anything burning they want to say. In which I think case, just apologies, we can't take the online questions because the room. And apologies, we can't take the online questions. But if perhaps if people want to log some questions, we can feed them um, back with the yeah. Parent Infant Foundation. Yeah. We'll try and get some answers to those. Great. Ten o'clock. Meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.